Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Estamos aquí y muchas felicidades al día de hoy. Ya un día de uh, internacional, día de mujeres y trabajadores. Um, y preparar esta actividad para nosotros el día de hoy con la doctora Olivia Camacho y su grupo de centro de uh, mujer y para su organización. Okay, all right, I'm going to change my uh, language to English uh, without impressing you with my Spanish. <laughs> uh, and thank you very much. And um, the title I chose, that's what we have been working on, and I know it is not very appropriate, the timing, because everybody is craving for food, and I'm going to talk about carbohydrates and metabolism, the glycotherapeutic, that's just glycose and sugar. Now the idea which I'm going to share with you, which, uh, which we have been trying from so the bench to the bedside, that is the approach and from basic uh, science to the clinical medicine and translational research. Um, and and I'm, I'm grateful that Dr. Akamachu put the basic scientists or sciences first because they are the pillar of all the water substances we do see at the clinic. At the, at the clinic. Um, I know that there is a big buzzword at NIH and even the White House about the translation research. The scientific community, including myself, we are very concerned because if we forget about basic research, then we create a big hole and then we have to create all the, um, uh, the, the expertise, we have to get them from elsewhere. It's exactly what is happening economically if you wanted to compare with that. So please, I uh, request and um, all to the younger faculty members and students, don't give up your basic research, because that's a good, uh, pillar of success. Now, the way my idea moved is just not in you know, a one fine morning and I got up, I said, okay, I have to do the translation research. It's basically over a period of time, from my graduate school to various training period and maturity in the field of science, that for I have been fortunate that all my research had clinical relevance. When I was a graduate student, I was looking for a cure for a genetic disorder called Tay-Sachs disease by, uh, by enzyme replacement therapy. Um, then I worked partly on the bronchial asthma, and we found it out that all the changes took place that could have some effect to, for, for, for their cure. Cardiovascular diseases, we also work because most of them are <coughs> endothelium or endothelial cells, and as you know, the endothelium is, which is the lining the blood vessels. And we understood from Dr. Crespo's work that if you remove the endothelium, the whole physiological function will be collapsed. Um, so based on, and also work on the blood coagulation uh, cascade, I'll just give you a brief uh, mention briefly when I come to that point. Now the important thing is that why breast cancer? So to me, the, 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 uh, the woman's heart is much deeper than an ocean. And their, their body is much more sacred than a religious institution. And in, in, in society, they have to carry out several functions. The mothers, wives, daughters, sisters, significant others, and employees and employer. Nevertheless, so because of the one replacement of only one chromosome, X to Y, that makes them completely different and physiologically. So we have to, and, and they get, as, as uh, at the time goes by, the wear and tear takes them and make them vulnerable to a variety of diseases. So now everybody's talking about um, uh, the uh, the uh, different types of approaches we should say take, and and more targeting with the um, with, with, with the with the different types of diagnosis we are talking about. But here, it is true that women population was never been incorporated until recently. Problem probably this is my calculation or my analysis based on that the most of them the scientists and physio and and, and all the physicians mostly dominated by the male members and they don't want to have the females be there. It's not because they want to discriminate them because they respect them so much. They don't want to bring them into that kind of uh, situation. But things are changing and, 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 and things will be improving in the future. So um, the idea is that why I have been interested and why I've been talking about the breast cancer because you can ask me questions and well, there are so many drugs available, why I'm interested in. 
And this is the one who just came out, published in Puerto Rico uh, Daily uh, Sun, the newspaper, in, on, on February 26th. It was uh, this young lady, this, this was in, in December 20th, 2011, has breast cancer, and sitting there with so many pills. It's not only that, that she needs the chemo and she needs a different type of therapeutics to treat her, her cancer, but also there are other ailments associated with that, so which would be cardiovascular, which would be diabetes, and so on and so forth. Now, when you look at the mortality or go to the chart based on and try to get the um, statistics done, what happens when somebody dies at the hospital, the doctor gives a note, is this done because of the cardiovascular failure, or respiratory failure, or, clinic, or, 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 or kidney failure? But they have to redesign the death certificate in such a way so that we can have a proper statistic. So we have still have a problem with that. So, so the right now, yeah, if, if you, if, yeah, other than tamoxifen, probably each one of them is so expensive. So some of them probably can give you the life expectancy for another two years, but it's going to cost you between eighty to ninety thousand dollars. And how many of us, even in this audience, in this room, can afford to have that because they are not not not. Not only they are not supported by the um, insurance company. So only the few percentage I mean, can have that access to that. What happened to the rest? And that breaks my heart, that we have something that we cannot reach to the, to the community who needs them badly. Now, if you look at the, some facts, that there are about uh, each year, we have about a million women are being diagnosed with breast cancer. And over 400,000, they die from the disease. And in the United States, it's over than 200,000. And the death rate is about 54, 56,000. Uh, it is true that male members also get breast cancer. So the percentage is very, very low. Uh, now, if you go from, move from one group to the other, you'll find that the African-American men and women probably have a 40% and are 18% higher of the death rate um, of, in all kinds of cancers combined than the white men and women respectively. The minority populations are also more likely to diagnose with the advanced stage of the disease than the white. The breast cancer incidence, as you can see here, as the people get more mature, the women, from, the, from age 20 to age 61 to 70, the vulnerability to, um, uh, due to the breast cancer are, are skyrocketing, actually exponential. So at the age of 61 to 70, there's one in 27 to be diagnosed with breast cancer. Now, what are the affected populations? There are the breast cancer more common in the upper socioeconomic classes who never been married, living in rural areas, or living in northern United States. The lower than average rates you can find on Mexican Americans, Japanese, and Filipinos, women who live in Hawaii, American Indians, and the Seventh day Adventists and Mormons. The higher than average risk, you'll find them in, in Jewish women, among Jewish women as well as the nuns. In Jewish? Jewish, right. And also, the, sometimes when you talk about one in 80, because this is what I learned, uh, just a curiosity sake, when I was going to go to this uh, translational research meeting in Dubai, and I was looking at it, what exactly their um, cancer rate is. It's much greater. Problem is that it's one in eight is a misnomer. This number will change because they don't allow the woman to go for physical examination. So they said there's a barrier. The re religion is also a barrier. So once you remove that, probably the number will come down to more or less than one in four. And I can just make a comment that still it's a lot less than the women are suffering due to the domestic violence. It's one in three. So that's another thing we have to be very, very careful about. So the questions. Why you are you lagging behind? Egyptians were discovered, uh, diagnosed in 1600 BC, and still we're trying to find out the proper cause of the disease and, and, the, and the relevant cure. So for the last over 50, last 50 to 60 years, this area got um, accelerated. It's uh, because the first gene, uh, the cancer-causing gene was discovered in 1970, and uh, President Richard Nixon in 1971 uh, passed the uh, National Cancer Act. So obviously that means that the federal government can release money for conducting research in a variety of places. So the question comes again that why it's taking so long and it's so slow because the disease, it, 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 it's very complex. The etiology is very complex. It's, it's multiple factors, which is the, the, 
the progression depends on the accumulations of mutations, various uh, chromosomal <coughs> aberrations, and also they are linked with a um, variety of other uh, the family history, which then and also are linked to BRCA1, BRCA2 gene mutations. Uh, the one other, another thing is, is it also complicates uh, to treat the patients because depending upon that, as you can see, that the progresses at the different stages um, it goes through. So it's, it's a stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four, where it's basically metastasis. So it's much easier to control when you are the first and stage one and stage two. But as it's progressing, multiple organs systems are being affected, same drug might not be working because they may have a different problem in equilibrating and going to different uh, organ systems, different cells and tissues. So that's why it gets more complicated. Um, so so that, that, that's why probably one single dose may not work. I mean, one single drug may not work. They may have to have it sometime in cocktails of, 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 of more than one type of drugs. Um, now the hallmark of cancer <coughs> progressions, they follow these six core principles. And these are angiogenesis, induction, I'll talk about in a second, and that's probably the core part of our, our, our research. Uh, the ability to enable replicated immortality, ability to e evade growth suppressors, sustainability for proliferative signaling, ability to resist cell death, and activating invasion and metastasis. That's why when you say, well, the tumor cells are notorious. If you block one, the other one comes out, or they activate some other pathways. So these are the six principles. So if we have to do stop the growth of progression and kill the tumor, probably we have to attack all of them at the same time, not just sequential manner. So uh, I mean, we, I mean, just to, to give you some idea, those who are not familiar with our, 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 our lab um, orientation, so Obviously, the angiogenesis, we putting at the first, and then it's translating the knowledge, what you're learning at the lab scale or the laboratory or the bench, trying to develop for breast and other solid tumors, because the angiogenesis is common to all solid tumor growth. So each, every tumor has that, needs that one. And also trying to identify the biomarkers so that we can early, put an early diagnosis to the patients, and more importantly, to the high-risk population. We are still searching here, but we have been fortunate to found out the tumor <coughs> uh, prognostic uh, marker. So it's not a signature yet, but it's very, very nice that uh, we, uh, we, we do see uh, when the tumor is aggressing by 66%, this marker is, is, is expressing at a very, very high level. So trying to um, uh, continue our studies with that. We also have model system to, do, to work on the congenital disorders of like oscillation. Uh, this is another uh, gen genetic disorders where the, uh, uh, there's no cure, basically, it's that. Okay. Um, diagnosis is done. Some of the things are the, because of the deficiency in the ending glycan, glycan chain biosynthesis, but there is no cure yet. And obvious, and also we, we work on the catacol catecholamine and glucose homeostasis, which are basically the bottom line of many of the cardiovascular diseases and, and, yeah, and diabetes, because endothelium. It's the anatomical barrier, the filter, which filters out from the blood to the interstitium. And it, it, earlier days it was say it's a passive barrier. No, it's a act, very active tissue. And it, it does regulate, and we know that we have found out different way the catecholamine being uh, degraded. They have a degrading enzymes. So high level of catecholamine and glostrum homeostasis has been degraded once it enters through endothelium or endothelial cells. So the basically is that the which are trying to um, uh, join this bridge. Our focus is on glycobiology, and they said that we work on sugars. Uh, and then how sugars means it's not just simple glucose, but sugars is when it's present in a molecule like a protein, which is the glycoproteins. And so they have a tremendous power and a function. And so if we can destroy that, hopefully we'll be learning more about it and dry, uh, draw more of uh, therapeutic, uh, find more therapeutic approaches to those. So this is the angiogenesis, that when the tumor grows, they need to they, 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 they trigger our, uh, the, to, to, to have a more new vessels to be formed um, for their own nourishment. Because without the blood supplies, the tumor doesn't go anywhere. So the, our approach, that's what the angiogenesis, the, our approach is, as well as many other people, they're trying to target tumors, and the tumors secrete some growth factors, and they have some um, antibody to that, which is called the avastin, 
and, and the two and the endothelial cell has the um, has the uh, receptor. So they will block the receptor ligand interactions and thinking that more of the same approach, the tumor will, will regress. And that uh, treatment costs about eighty to ninety thousand dollars. And it is not it has extended the life expectancy by two years, but did not change the mortality. The FDA said stop it. So they have stopped the use of investing or um, uh, uh, for breast cancer treatment. So we have come up with some other uh, uh, targets, target not targeting the to directly tumor cells, but targeting directly to the um, endothelial cells. And, and so we developed a model system, and as you can see here, that this, if you can culture them for one week to three weeks, and this will develop capillary-like structure. And this is the one which I, when I was working at NIH, and that's when we developed it. And these uh, cells made a fact blood coagulation uh, protein called factor eight, which is deficient in hemophilia. And from some or other, we have to convince the NIH to do the, our first patent application. And that was the first ever the NIH patented the research product. And now, obviously, you know they do it every time. So you know, this is our model system which we use. And they have a very distinct uh, uh, the growth profile. So the cell cycle, you can look at it. And you can change it in presence of it, it gets changed in presence of the growth factors, how you're stimulating that. And obviously, we use uh, various uh, techniques, my, microscopy and others. Um, now to say a few things about the estrogen, this is uh, this is more appropriate here, and we, we learned quite a bit about the, the the action of estrogen. But look at the estrogen effect on angiogenesis. So then you know that the estrogen does promote the uh, the breast tumor growth, and it has a biphasic action. At the lower concentration, between one to ten nanomolar range, it will probably more cause uh, cellular adhesions and proliferation. But the higher concentration, it goes mostly to the tube formation. These are the ones we're talking about. So it has a biphasic effect. So probably by blocking estrogen or estrogen receptors, so secretion or estrogen receptors, we may be able to um, block that one. That was the estrogen positive tumors, so the um, ER positive tumors that will be treated with, with an oxygen, which, which blocks this in receptor. Uh, the cells obviously has a variety of a very nice uh, uh, cytoskeletal network, which, which gives the cells to, to give the motility. So the cytoskeleton is just under the plasma membrane. And it's a, a beautiful picture, so I like to show that one and share with you. <laughs> and it makes a variety of glycoproteins. And they are all, these are the cell si si uh, surface glycoproteins by micro immunoprocess microscopy. We used it and use the lectins, which stains a different type of uh, carbohydrate epitope on a glycoprotein. Some of them high mannose types, the WG is for the uh, complex type. And, and one of the proteins you mentioned was the factor eight, as you can see, that was the first indication. The factor eight actually precedes the cellular proliferation, and that gives us the first indication <coughs> that the glycoprotein plays a role, and there is a connection between the cellular proliferation and glycoprotein biosynthesis. And here is the factor eight we talked about, which is involved in the blood coagulation cascade. Um, so based on that, uh, we then try to get into more deeper into that and to find out where exactly we should start and where we should interfere with that. And the enter glycoprotein biosynthesis is much more complex. It's, it is all, it, these are two compartments. This is the end, uh, endoplasm reticulum followed by uh, Golgi uh, processing. Um, so the, these are the final products. You see that by glycomics, so the equivalent to mass spectrometric analysis, each one is a different sugar. So there's a uh, these are the NSA glucosamine, these are mannose, then uh, the fucose, um, uh, the, the galactose, and so on and so forth. Then it's the galactosamine, and then sialic acid. So e if you remove one sugar from there, the entire protein will be degraded. So it's very, and, and they are part of the receptors, they are also the transporter, and so on. So we tried to concentrate on the very first stage of the glycan assembly process. And we concentrate on two different enzymes called DPMS and GPT. And DPMS, it has a uh, it, ha it has a phosphorylation domain, and we can we can phosphorylate it, and then we can enhance the cycle, uh, the entire processes, and the cell proliferation goes up. Uh, we have also done it by overexpressing the gene. It does the same thing, and to to prove it, that we have also reduced the, uh, we took the knock down the gene by uh, 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 interfering R uh, RNA, and it causes the um, decrease of the of the glycan chain biosynthesis and, and the proliferation of the endothelial cells. When we looked at it, we also found that there is another enzyme 
called GPT. There's a big name, acid glucosaminate one phosphate transferase. So, so it's a glycosyl transferases. So somewhere there's also in, you know, affecting the activity of this enzyme. We, we don't know at this moment, but you know, we talk about the crosstalk, and I just recently published a review, which is still in the press, I mean, it came out on their website. Uh, and, 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 the, and the important part is that, that in a in, in clinical setting, or even in a, uh, that we cannot block it, because there's no inhibitor, other than by using the, um, uh, using the genetic approach. But I know that FDA was not going to give us the genetic, uh, use, the, uh, use the, uh, the gene approach to develop any therapeutics at this moment. But this particular enzyme, there's an inhibitor available. It's, uh, and its name is, and that's what we use this. So now we focus to inhibit this enzyme, block the inter pathway, block the glycan chain biosynthesis, and look at what happens in the eugenic process. Um, okay, this is the structure here. There's a core structure. There are 16 different homologs. So you have to be very, very careful to select that particular one. And we've been lucky that we selected the right one. And, and so when you treat the cells, and you can see the, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, expression of the cell surface glycans are also inhibited. Uh, we also looked at the earlier uh, 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 steps. I, mean, I just left out because of the time and things like that. But and the bottom line is it's, it's here. Um, and if you treat the cells with, with tunicamycin, now I want forgot to mention tunicamycin is a structure is known for a long time. It was discovered as an antibiotic. Five more minutes? Okay, yeah. Uh, antibiotic. And, 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 and the, it, it's for the bacterial cell wall in gram-positive bacteria. It blocks the same reaction as it does in human system. So we have found its use, and if you treat the cells, and you can see what happens, the cell lose, it loses all its uh, uh, in, intercellular connections. Then there is a uh, pycnotic appearance, cell, cell, uh, the, the surface flaving, uh, and also the uh, nuclear fragmentation, which gives us the approach the cells are dying to, to, through the program cell death, or which called the apoptosis. And further proof came up by the DNA laddering studies and also the binding of an exit 5 Now, if you take the, the so many years of work in one slide, it's basically what happened is blocking the cell prolifer proliferative antigen, the BCL2. Um, and, 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 and activating this pathway, but it is distinctly different, the mechanism, than what we know so far about the apoptotic pathway, which means it does not, it, it is independent of cytochrome C release, which is a mitochondrial pathway. So we did not find any indication of the ap ap uh, aptosome formation even by proteomic analysis, but nevertheless, that the caspase 3, caspase 9, they're all activated. Maybe there's a very small amount of Procaspis 9 available, or Caspis 12 is directly activating to that. And here's the tunicamycin. Its home is kind of endoplasmic reticulum. It also releases calcium, which activates endonuclease, and you can see the DNA strand break. Now, before we go into the animal model, we wanted to be, make sure that this control is fine, because we know that now we, we did the studies that if you had a growth factors, VEGF, it cannot overcome. So once the cell sees the tunicamycin, is programmed to set, it's programmed to die. So that's what this shows, and it's going to downregulating the tyrosine kinase activity, and the receptor um, um, major receptors phosphorylation is also downregulated. That's on the cells. Now I'm moving to our our, our patients, with the with called the nude mice. They don't have far, and they have um, uh, atymic nude mice. There's no tumor here. We try to grow, uh, develop the blood vessels by aging PHF. And then, uh, and then treat them with tunicamycin. As you can see here, if you add tunicamycin, there's hardly any blood vessel formation, and there is a uh, quantification of the data. So, and also you look at the uh, expression of CD34, CD144. These are more specific for endothelial cell markers, and they do the same thing. They tell us the same thing, that if you treat the cells with tunicamycin, even in presence of AGF, the vascular cell growth factors, there is hardly any CD34, CD144 is expressed, which means the endothelium or the, or the blood vessels are not being formed, or maybe forming at a very, very low level. So at this moment, we just turned into that, so we got so um, excited that it looks like it's going to work in, 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 in a real case scenario that we'll be treating the patients with this drug. But most of the time, the clinical trial fails because we don't know the control, 
and, and they neutralize the effect of the, of the therapeutic. So here is the, uh, the, the uh, tumor was developed. It's a, it's a double negative, HER2 positive, and ER negative, and progesterone negative tumor. And if you treat this, uh, titrate the tonicomycin concentration as different dosage, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 1 milligram per <laughs> kilogram, and you can see within three, uh, three uh, weeks, there's over 55 percent reduction of the tumor growth. And here's uh, uh, the, 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 the end point of the result. And if you need to add the Taxol, which is already available, it needs 15 times more Taxol to get the similar effect. And the histopathology supports our findings. Um, so now the, the, the question is a little bit about the uh, um, mechanism that you can look at the blood vessels, the clinical treated blood vessels, how thin and small they become. And, 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 the, and the, the process is through the um, ER stress. We talked about oxidative stress, GRP 78 expression. We found that the GRP expression, 78 expression, is very high. And here's the uh, slide for the tumor tissue. We do see some degree of ER stress as well, but uh, literature says that they don't undergo ER stress with the, with the same drug, but we are looking into, um, in, in, into uh, more de detail into that in, in a laboratory nitrogen system. Uh, we also change it to uh, triple negative, and you can see that uh, within one week, the triple negative uh, breast cancer is dropped. With the, the xenograft is, is at 65%. These two have been given orally. The other one is in the injection. So, so based on our, our initial observations, we, support, we submitted a patent to the US Patent and Trademark Office. And yes, we're lucky enough that after a long uh, battle that we got the patent is issued in 2008. But that's where we are, because the question is that the university is not moving forward to take it to, to the clinical or to the commercialization. Until we do that, we, we won't see the drug anymore. But I am working on it, and I'm try, trying to join forces, including NCI and others, and to see whether we can uh, take it to the phase one clinical trial. And, and chances are much greater at this stage. Um, so these are some of the members, uh, which uh, some of the students, postdocs, Undergraduate students, the, uh, the list could be much longer, but I had to shorten it out. And we have a couple of um, um, collaborators, including MD Anderson, Lee Moffitt Cancer Center, Carmanos Cancer Center, uh, VA Medical Center. So we are global in that respect. And I do have collaboration also with EPR and probably de developing now with the Boston School of Medicine as well. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.